According to the Bullock Times, July 12, 1913, while engaged in a debate at the high school Thursday, Ellis Lanier died of apoplexy. According to the Statesboro News, April 15, 1915, Ms. Ferdy McConnell and Mr. Lester Smith were united in marriage in their auto in front of the Roundtree Hotel, Sunday, April 11th. Auto weddings are becoming very frequent of late. According to the Bullock Times, October 31, 1918, Brooks Beasley, Carswell Deal, Parker Hughes, James Frank Scott, and James Ward Williams died October 6th in a Toronto disaster. The ship had arrived safely overseas when it collided with another vessel. They were among more than 300 men who were drowned. According to the Statesboro News, December 20th, 1901, the money has been subscribed for the erection of an electric water and power plant in Statesboro. The plant will cost about $15,000. If there is no hitch in the plans, our town will have lights by October 1st. According to the Statesboro News, July 18th, 1902, we chronicle the sad death of Mr. and Mrs. B. A. Cock, which occurred by drowning in the Aguichi River near Scarborough last Thursday. Mr. A. Cock and his young wife of less than three months, the former Annie Wood, were bathing and drowned before assistance could reach them. Mr. A. Cock was the son of Mr. E. B. A. Cock and lived in Dublin. He and his bride were spending a few weeks at his old home place in Bullock as their bridal trip. A family picnic was arranged in honor of the visit. About noon, the young couple decided to go bathing. He was a strong swimmer and was in deep water. She was on a sandbank in shallow water, lost her balance, and was carried into deep water. Her husband instantly sprang to the rescue. He caught her as she came to the surface, and she clutched him so tightly about the neck that he was unable to swim, and they both went down to rise no more. The bodies were recovered and were buried side by side in the Acock burial ground. According to the Statesboro News, March 3, 1914, the snowstorm which spread a white blanket over the entire South last week left five inches in Statesboro. Considerable damage was done to timber and the telephone and telegraph companies had lots of trouble with their wires, the service of each being crippled for two or three days. According to the Statesboro News, April 15, 1915, Ms. Verdi McConnell and Mr. Lester Smith were united in marriage in their auto in front of the Roundtree Hotel, Sunday, April 11th. Auto weddings are becoming very frequent of late. But probably early 50s, uh, the train didn't come through anymore, so that changed some. After the war, the old train had just about taken his last breath for local and area transportation, but not before he saw fit to create towns across the country, and certainly towns here in Bullitt County too. Like exits off the interstate, communities and towns popped up along the railroad tracks. It, it went to Midville. It started in Statesboro. I, I, I assumed it started in Statesboro. That's what I remember as a child and it went to Midville and turned around and came back. In many ways, the train itself became a piece of folk art within our history. The rail systems faded as transportation became individualized, and the uses of the rail systems had to change for the structure to survive, even in a limited, narrow way. My grandfather was a doctor in Portal, and he delivered my brother and I, and he finished middle school like in 1910 from Atlanta and came back here to open a practice. And the railroad track used to come through here and we used to have a train that would stop. And the depot was just across the street from his office. 
So we enjoyed riding the train. We uh, could ride it to Statesboro, and uh, we'd go to the show, and then we could ride the train back. And uh, I can't remember. I, I want to think it cost us a dime, but I'm not quite sure. It changed completely, and I guess that's why the, the railroad quit, and it sort of lost lost whatever it had. We used to walk the railroad tracks and everything, and I can remember when my granddaddy died and everything, the conductor. I was standing for, waiting for the train to pass on the line, and of course it was going real slow, and, I, and he knew that I was uh, Barry Davis's granddaughter, and he, he t expressed his sympathy about my granddaddy passing. So that was just, to me, I thought was just so unusual for uh, the conductor, I thought, because he was such a great man, he was driving a train. <laughs> and the train does survive, and has found a definite, sustaining, but limited role in transportation today. But unlike the rail system, having capitalized on a sustaining purpose, main streets are a bit different. My great granddaddy came to this uh, area when Black Sea Cotton was king. At that time, the people, when they died, had family cemeteries that they buried their loved ones in. So when my great-granddaddy died, he was buried in a family cemetery, which is this cemetery. And his wife was buried with him, and several of his uh, children and grandchildren are buried in this cemetery. Back then, Portal was bustling. We had uh, cotton. They went from the yellow pine to cotton. Uh, we had th three gins here. I remember Mom talking about chopping cotton, picking cotton. The gins ran night and day during cotton season because they, there was that much cotton coming in. And uh, they would, you could hear them all during the night, and the air was full of the lint from, from it. And I know that some of the, the people complained about the lint being on their screen porch so <laughs> they couldn't get a breeze through it. So. As commerce changes, so does the focus of downtown districts. And while the trains have found a concrete place in transportation, commerce is an ever-changing creature, for sure. We have defeated the purpose of the downtown areas of, of uh, our small towns. We have permitted this to happen by moving new industry, new build, new new companies is bigger is better so to speak even your schools bigger is better after the boll weevil ruined the highly sought after sea island cotton tobacco found a way here in bullock county as a new cash crop every farmer had tobacco barns they were either 16 by 16 or 20 by 20. they were structures made of poles they were put together with uh with mud and and uh, and they had ten roofs. I remember that so well. We would, uh, they would take sleds, go through the tobacco uh, fields, and pick the uh, ripe leaves and bring them in. And then uh, tobacco was strung on sticks, and then those sticks was raised up into a, a tobacco barn that had rafters in there that these sticks would fit on. I remember when Daddy first roofed tobacco, they had a tobacco barn that you had to fire by wood. If one of those sticks fell on one of those pipes, it was so hot it would burn the tobacco barn down. And they would sit up all night to keep that fire at a... I guess I, they didn't have any thermometers, so they just had to gauge what the uh, heat was to uh, cure that tobacco. The uh, heat from the bottom, which they fired with wood, some of them did, and then eventually they used uh, oil uh, heaters to... to uh, to heat the uh, flues and everything to, to dry it out. The one structure it seems that hasn't changed in downtown Statesboro is the courthouse. From a log cabin to the restored historic piece of architecture we have today, the courthouse certainly has always anchored the downtown district. It has never failed to keep downtown Statesboro alive, and it has always served the same general purpose. You know where the courthouse is in the buildings right the street right there, mm -hmm. that's where my Western Union was, right there, right, you could see them going in the back door at the courthouse, right there is where it was.